me see. <laughs> I'm gonna miss that uh, face. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Impersonal verbs. Okay, it's a weird concept. Um, it's verbs who, who which are stuck in the third person singular, and which don't have a a person, a, 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 a she, a he, a you, or an I as the subject. Okay. And the subject is, in such verbs, is it, okay, which is not a person by definition, and it's a kind of filler word, okay. Mm -hmm. But we have these in English, and we do something very similar to what Greek does with them. Um, this lesson introduces you to two of them, de, which means it is necessary, and chre, which also means it is necessary. That's not mince words here. Chre is originally a noun that functions... Um, as a as a subject and a, in a in a verbless sentence, okay, and then it becomes because it means need, okay, mm -hmm. and then it means there is a need, and then it becomes a, just a verb. Sorry about the blackout. So we, they and cray both me are impersonal verbs, okay. They is a real verb, and it comes from it's the fundamental. There is a, a actually a version of it that has different persons. And it means there is a lack, okay? And then it comes to mean there is a need. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they has, all the forms of day and cray are laid out for you in the book very nicely. On page 566, there are some funny features of day. The main being that only in the present and the imperfect does it exhibit contraction. In all the other forms, there is no contraction. But the most common forms of it are in the present and the imperfect. Um, they also give you a full array of forms of cray, but most of the time you see it in the present of the imperfect as well. And the way you made cray into a verb is by munging it together with forms of the verb to be a very strange procedure, but it makes sense also. So how do we use these verbs in sentences? They means it is necessary, cray means it is necessary. And what we do in English is we say it is necessary that somebody do something, okay? Or we say it is necessary for someone to do something. Okay, and you you can see both of those constructions in Greek. The book emphasizes the former one. That is, when you say it is necessary that someone do something, what you've got is an embedded sentence, mm -hmm. and these verbs both take accusative and infinitive constructions. So de hemas tuto poiesai, or chre hemas tuto poiesai means it is necessary that we do this thing. Okay, or you can also translate it. It is necessary for us to do this thing, but for us sounds like a dative, mm -hmm. and you sometimes do see he mean to to poiesai. The book points out something that I wasn't aware of before. Ude he mas to to poiesai can mean it is not necessary for us to do this thing or that we do this thing, but it can also mean there is no need uh, to do for us to do these things, this thing. In other words, there, is, there are times when um, this, the older sense of day as expressing a, something missing or lacking mm -hmm. can be more semantically appropriate than the necessity or obligation, which Cray can, is the only thing that Cray can do, okay? Mm -hmm. The last example is really a place where you can see that this meaning of day is having to do with need or lack comes to the forefront. So it can govern a genitive de. De he mean, so far sune means there is a need in us of budens. Okay? Um, so you can have a genitive to express the, the what's the la thing that you're lacking. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, the last example involving these words is the one at the top of this page where it's, you have a sentence, aye poiumen ta de anta. Ta de anta is just an attributive participle, neuter, nominative, uh, neuter, nominative or accusative plural. In this case, it's accusative because we have a subject expressed in the verb. Aye poiumen, we are always doing. And what ta de anta means is the things which are necessary. Right? Ta de anta. So this is a, it's a, an important concept, ta de anta, or ta de on, that which is necessary in Greek philosophy and otherwise in real life. Okay, so continuing in the, in the theme of impersonal verbs, mm -hmm. and on the previous lesson I think we got introduced to the verb dakeo, 
which means think or seem and can take all the subjects you want. I think I seem to be doing something, I think something, and so forth. But it also has a special sense in the impersonal third person. Um, and it it's, means, that in these cases, it seems best. It can be, it can be present or imperfect or aorist or what have you. So the, the examples that the book gives are, <clears throat> which are decent examples, da ke moi, tu ta poyen, it seems good to me to do this. Okay? So you have to watch out with this verb. You have to think, is this personal or impersonal? Now, there's a general preference for personal forms of da ke but there's plenty of examples of da ke. There's also the one that I mentioned where we had da ke in the vocabulary in the last lesson, that it's the way you introduce a decree in Athenian politics. Edoxa te boule kai to demo. It seemed best, it seemed good to the boule and the demos. Okay, um, standard, standard way that you see in the inscriptions. So that's, that's that. The last thing we want to talk about is a so-called accusative absolute. Okay, this is, this is in the way of what happens when you want to do an, imper an absolute construction Remember genitive absolutes, okay? This is when you have a want to make a, a, a participial construction. That's a circumstantial participle, but you don't have a noun in the sentence for the participle to agree with. Okay? We, we talked about them before. We had them a long time ago. In that case, since there's no noun for the participle to agree with, with you put the subject of the of the clause in the genitive and the participle in the genitive agreeing with it. And then it can take direct objects and adverbs and all the other things that a, that a clausal participle can take. So in that case, there's no agreement with any verb in the sentence. So the standard sentence we had then was, when King Tut came, they feathered, tethered their elephants, right? There's, there's no grammatical relationship. And that's what absolute means. It's uh, absolved from the rest of the sentence, grammatically speaking. So how could you do such a thing with an impersonal verb? Um, you could theoretically put it in the genitive, but Greek did something else, which was it put the impersonal verb where the subject is neuter and not expressed in the accusative, okay? Um, neuter, singular, right? Mm -hmm. And it corresponds to the grammatical notion of it, right, mm -hmm. if you want. So, so the accusative absolute is an impersonal verb, not agreeing with anything, um, but being impersonal, and constituting the, the, the participle of a clause that's grammatically absolved from the rest of the sentence. So in the example sentence, de on decane dunai, ectes pola os effugete, there's no grammatical connection between the two parts. And how are we going to translate it? Since it is necessary, or it being necessary, to pay the penalty, ectes polaros effugete, you fled from the city-state. Okay? No, no grammatical linking. And de on is the accusative absolute. So you see this often with de on. You also see it often with the neuter accusative singular participle of excess de, another verb in this lesson, which means it is possible. Um, exon zane it being possible to live. There's a famous quote in the series, Heminda exon zain, me kalos, it being, it not being possible for us to live well. You know this one? Heminda exon zain. Oh, hold on. I'm right now. Yeah, I think. Heminda exon zain, me kalos. There you go. Me kalos. So it means, since it is possible for us, it is not possible for us to live well, the rest of it goes, kalos hairomitha malan terutan, we choose instead to die well. Mm. Okay. Yeah, noble sentiment. <laughs> okay, so that's it for impersonal verbs and their phenomena.